Okay, hello. Um, all right, so I'm going to start by talking about primary and secondary qualities a little bit more, unless uh, there are any questions um, about metaphysics exercises, syllabus, office hours. Um, everyone should have got a Zoom invitation to my Monday office hour and to my Tuesday office hour. I hope everyone did. Um, okay, so back to primary and secondary qualities. Um, hmm. I changed that, but okay. My notes. Okay, so anyway, so what I was talking about at the end last time was the question, um, I guess, in what sense and why does Locke think that only primary, all and only primary qualities are really in bodies, and the secondary qualities are not really in bodies. Um, and, um, so what I concluded was basically, well, so first of all, both primary and secondary qualities are in external bodies, right? I mean, the distinction between quality and idea is that the quality is in the, is in the object, the external object, and the idea is in us. Um, so the quality of whiteness is in the snowball, just like the quality of sphere, sphericity is in the snowball. Um, but the question is, um, in what sense is whiteness not really in the snowball, whereas sphericity is really in the snowball? Right, and I, so I said, well, there are two things, right? A quality is a power. It's a power to cause us to perceive a certain idea. And so first of all, Primary qualities are real powers, right? And that was what I spent a lot of, oops. Okay. I tested this right before the lecture started too. And There we go. Equality is a power, and primary qualities are real powers. And that's what I spent a lot of time talking about on Tuesday, about the distinction between real powers and bare powers, right? So, um, whereas secondary qualities are bare powers. And the other point was, and this is what I ran out of time to explain at the end last time, primary qualities resemble our ideas. That is, our ideas of them. Right, and so, whereas secondary qualities do not.
And what I was saying at the end on Tuesday was that, um, um, oh wait, there's a question in the chat here. Are the metaphysics exercises cumulative on everything we've gone over so far? No, the new one will always just be on new material. Oh, okay. Um, so, sorry, getting back to this. So, as I was saying at the end on Tuesday, um, you know, when you first think of it, look at this, it's like, oh, I see, primary qualities kind of look like our ideas of them. But then I was claiming that that way of understanding it really doesn't make sense. And I was introducing another way of understanding it, which was that um, resemble here means, and this is one of the things that resemble can mean as a technical term. Resemble means that they are analogous. Primary qualities are analogous to our ideas of them. What do I mean by analogous? By the way, do I have, am I using the right mic? Am I getting much softer when I go over to the board? Or is it working now? Okay. So an analogy, I guess I'm going to erase all of this. It's not that hard to remember. An analogy is a relationship between two ratios. I usually write it this way. A is to B as C is to D. That's called an analogy. Right? So like a numerical analogy would be like um, 1 is to 2 as 2 is to 4 where the ratios are numerical ratios. But um, but uh, Aristotle already generalized this to the idea of other types of relationships between things that aren't numbers. So, uh, um, so just, you know, broadly speaking, the analogy means that there's the same relationship on both sides, even though A and C might not be at all like each other and B and D might not be at all like each other. The relationship between them is the same. And so what I was claiming is that, um, and I, well, I guess I should say, um, and this is a simple example of structural identity or isomorphism, right? Where there's only two terms on each side, but more generally speaking, you can think of an isomorphism or a structural similarity as meaning that, you know, um, there's some kind of complicated different relationships between a bunch of things. And then over here, there's the same one between some uh, completely other things. Right? So again, you would say like, you know, call this A and this, you know, A prime. A and A prime might not be similar to each other at all, but A stands in the same relationship to all these other things as, it's not really weird, but as A prime does to these. Right, so that you could think of that as a broader sense of analogy or a generalization of the idea of analogy. So I'm, what I'm claiming is that that's what Locke means by resemblance. When Locke says our ideas of primary qualities resemble the qualities, he means that, that our ideas of the primary qualities are related to each other in an analogous way to the way the qualities themselves are related to each other. And I tried to explain, so first of all, do people understand that? I, Maybe I should, 
Well, see, so I can't give an example. Why can't I give an example? I mean, I can verbally give an example, but it won't be helpful because I can't ever say, right, if these are the ideas and these are the corresponding qualities. It's the same problem I was talking about before. I can't tell you what the quality is except by using the idea. Right, so I can't tell you what the quality of whiteness is except by saying that it's the power to cause us to perceive the idea of white. At least, according to Locke, I can't do that. Um, so, you know, what's on this side will be, what is going to be our ideas, and what's on this side is going to be basically, we don't know what, but we know something about how they're related to each other. And so, and my claim was that what makes this possible in the case of primary qualities, oh, okay, could you just repeat that question in the chat? Oh, it's a direct message, but I guess I can read it out anyway. That's okay, right? I mean, I'm not saying who said it, so. Could you just repeat that one more time? Our ideas of primary qualities and their relationship to the, to the qualities, oh, sorry, our ideas of primary qualities and their relationship to the qualities are analogous to the relationship between the qualities themselves. No, it's the relationship between the ideas is analogous to the relationship between the qualities. It's simpler than what you asked in that question. <laughs> it's right. It's just the ideas have some kind of, I mean, maybe this will be easier. They, I, I can make this a little bit more, uh, I can make this a little bit more concrete because I can say what the relationship is here. The relationship is going to be necessary connection. Right? And that's why I read you that quote from book four where he says that, you know, in general, we see no necessary connection between our distinct ideas. But he says some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another as figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. Right? So in those cases, in those some few cases of the, involving the primary qualities, um, we, even though they're different ideas, we can see that they necessarily go together. Right, so, I mean, uh, in the simplest case, we would say, like, you know, here's two ideas. This idea, call it A, necessarily goes together with this other idea, call it B. Now, what it means by go together, I guess it's something like in any case where I've been caused to perceive A, I can be caused to perceive B by the same thing if circumstances are right or something like that. Um, so, so these ideas, so from just from experiencing this one, I know that I can experience that one. Um, now, of course... I can't, I, according to Locke, I don't have either of those ideas except from experience, right? So I must have experienced both, the, I must have had both the idea of A and the idea of B before, before, from either from sensation or reflection. But what I don't have to have had is an experience of them going together. It's just clear from looking at them, so to speak, that they must go together. They have a visible connection and necessary dependence one on the other. So that's the ideas. Now let's look at the qualities. Well, so, you know, call this quality big A and this quality big B. Um, well, if I perceive A, then if I perceive small A, then the quality big A must have caused me to perceive it.
And then I know that I can perceive B. But I also know that if I perceive B, then the quality, small B, then the quality big B must have caused me to perceive it. Right? These are like little eyeballs, acts of sensation, operations of, of the faculty of sensation. Right? So from A, I can conclude necessarily that I can have B, but if I can have B, that must mean that big B is there. Right, because big B by definition is whatever power in the object causes me to receive B. So therefore, from this necessary connection among my ideas, I can conclude that there's a necessary connection among the qualities. Right, if the idea small b can't come without the idea small a, then that must mean that the quality big A can't come without the quality big B. And this, so this is the analogy, right? We don't really know what big A and big B are. I mean, we do and we don't, right? I mean, we know as much as, we know the only thing we can know about them, which is what they cause us to perceive, right? So uh, in a sense, we know what they are, but we don't know what they are. As I said before, we don't have some way of looking behind our idea to see what they look like without our idea. Right, so if, if I forget about that big A causes small a, I, I have to say I don't know what big A is at all. And similarly for big B, but I do, but nevertheless I know something about them because I know that whatever they are, there's a necessary connection between them. So like if we go back to the snowball example, here's the snowball. So, I mean, now, the necessary relation I'm going to talk about is a little more complicated than this, but it's not a lot more complicated. So, in, so sorry, so here's the idea of the snowball. So, so the idea of a snowball has, you know, the I contains the idea of a radius and a circumference. I didn't draw that very well, but <laughs> imagine that Right, so <clears throat> the idea of it's still lopsided. It's because of the angle I'm drawing it, I guess. It has a rate that is a snowball appears to have both a width and a circumference. Maybe I should say diameter and circumference. That'll be easier to explain. It has both a diameter and a circumference, meaning um, that. Um, If I hold it in my hands, I can feel both a, a distance across it and a distance around it. I don't know if I can, can I feel the distance across it? Well, let's say I do. In some sense, I do. But I don't know if it's the sense that's helpful here. But let's say I do. All right. <laughs> so I feel both that there's, you know, that there's a distance across it that, you know, that it won't let my hands approach closer than a certain amount and that there's a distance around it. Now, and you might think, well, it's... Um, 
the distance across it and the distance and around it could be anything, right? Like the distance across it could be three inches, but the distance around it could be, um, well, I guess it couldn't be more than my hands that I, if I feel it, but, you know, or it could be small. It could be like the distance across it is three inches, but the distance around it is one inch. You might think that, but uh, according to Locke, you can't really think that. Right? There's a visible necessary relation between the diameter and the circumference. So, um, like, for example, you know that the diameter, that the uh, circumference is proportional to the diameter. Locke is, Locke is going to say that we don't know geometrical truths like that from experience. Again, you might say, well, are we gauging, someone asks, are we gauging shape or dimension? Or dimension, like length, right? I'm saying, like, how, how big is the diameter versus how big is the circumference, right? So, they, you know, the point is, like, given the diameter, I know what the circumference will be and vice versa. They can't be just anything. And again, Locke is going to say that even though, I mean, I only get the idea of distance um, and roundness and so forth from experience. Without that, I couldn't know this truth. But once I have those and I pay attention to them, I'll see that they're necessarily connected, that there's necessarily a relation between this diameter and this circumference. And as I was saying, for example, that, you know, if you double the diameter, you also double the circumference. So if we look into the cause of the snowball, I mean, sorry, if we look into the snowball itself, here's the snowball. So we know the snowball has a power to cause me to perceive a certain diameter when I put my hands in a certain way. And we know the snowball has a power to cause me to perceive a certain circumference. And we know those powers have a certain relationship with each other. Right? Like if you make this one, so to speak, twice as diameter -y, right? Like, if you, if you change it in a, in a certain way, which, again, like, forgetting about our ideas, we can't say what that way is. But there's a way to change it. The way to change it that will make this diameter feel double. We know that at the same time, this power must change in such a way as to make the circumference feel double. So, um, and what I was claiming is that, um, so again, there's this, you know, analogy between these basically unknown powers and their relationship to each other, and these ideas and their relationship to each other. And since the ideas have a necessary relation, the powers must have a necessary relation. And what I was basically claiming is that the the question of whether the power is a thing in the substance or not, which, um, when it comes down to it, is a little bit hard to understand, even though, you know, like William of Ockham and people who argue with him seem to feel like they understand it. When you, when you think about it more, you're like, well, I mean, what, how do you, what difference does it make if it's a thing or not? So I think Locke has actually given it a more abstract and, um, useful interpretation. He's saying that what it means that these powers are two different things is that we know a structure of powers in the object that has two terms. Right? I mean, it doesn't mean that the snowball itself has two little blobs in it. One is the circumference power and one is the diameter power. That doesn't make sense. 
right? Having blobs is something that basically our ideas do, <laughs> and then we can ascribe to outside things the quality of having blobbiness because they cause us to perceive blobs, right? But if you're forgetting about our ideas, then you can't be talking about things that are in the snowball in that way, like stuck into it like a pin. And in any case, that wouldn't, I mean, obviously that's not how the diameter is related to the snowball. It's not like it's stuck into it and you could pull it out and put it somewhere else or whatever. So Locke is, is like I said, he's giving a more abstract understanding of what the question is here. The question is, um, is there a structure of powers in the snowball that we know about? Now, like to make this clearer, if we talk on the other hand, let's say, so the snowball also contains, the idea of the snowball also contains both the idea of white and the idea of cold. But we don't see any relationship between those two ideas, according to Locke. We learn from experience that white things that have certain other properties tend to be cold. And we use the word snowball to stand for those things. But if you just look at the ideas themselves, there's no relationship between them that we can see. So what about the powers in the snowball? And the answer is, I think that, like, from the fact that the idea of white and the idea of cold are two different ideas, we don't learn anything about whether there are or are not two different powers in the snowball. All we learn is basically what we already knew, that we have two different senses. Presumably because we have two different sense organs. Which, I mean, just in one way we understand that because they're in different places. That's a matter of primary qualities, right? In another way, we don't really understand that. We don't understand how bodies cause us to perceive one idea or the other at all, according to Locke. And he seems to tend towards adopting an occasionalist understanding of it, that God basically makes the us perceive the right idea at the right time but I mean he doesn't go so far as to assert that either he says we don't so you know so uh, like uh, we know that somehow these two different sense organs result in different kinds of ideas in us but that doesn't tell us anything about difference similarity real any kind of relationship within the external object and that's why the secondary qualities are bare powers Okay, so, um, and of course, because solidity is one of these primary qualities, that's going to ex explain some of the puzzling features of solidity. Like, for example, how do we know, how do I know that if I keep dividing a body over and over again, the pieces I divided into always must have solidity. So, I mean, of course, up to a point, you could say I know it by experience, right? Like I, this almond is solid and I cut it in half and I feel both of the halves and they're both still solid. But if I start dividing the almond over and over and over again until the parts become too small for me to see, why, according to Locke, do we still know that all the parts must be solid? This is this is something that the uh, the text for the discussion goes into, right? How is it that the mind follows solidity into smallest parts that it can't feel anymore or see? I just switched from vision to touch. Um, I really think touch is the primary sense to talk about here, but I don't know if I probably don't really have time to talk about why. why. Um, um, except that I guess I'll say, you know, Locke says a body that's square um, to one hand never, never feels round to the other. So, I mean, 
right, as opposed to uh, water that's hot to one hand can feel cold to the other. This is, you know, part of his discussion of the difference between primary and secondary qualities. Well, you know, I mean, one of Descartes' famous examples is the tower that looks round from far away and square when you get close up. So, um, and Barclay is going to say, basically, like, what are you talking about? Of course something can look round from one place and square from another. But that's not what Locke said. He didn't talk about vision. He talked about holding it in my hands. And that, at least plausibly, is a very different case, right? Like if it feels square to one hand, it's not going to feel round to the other hand. Um, I don't know if that's really true or, you know, but at least it's, it's plausible as opposed to saying the same thing about vision, which wouldn't be plausible at all. All right, so anyway, um, so that's why I think touch is really the primary sense here. But anyway, so, what I was, so I interrupted myself. I was saying that, you know, how do we know that no matter how many times you divide a body, you will still have solidity? The answer, I think, is that this is one of the necessary, visible necessary uh, connections between ideas, right? We know that there's a, there's a visible necessary connection between the idea of solidity and the idea of division. Now, it's not a simple one, like wherever there's solidity, there's division. It's a more complicated one, but it's like wherever those, there's solidity, division will produce parts that still have solidity, where division means that a new surface comes to exist where there was none before, or superficies, as Locke says. <laughs> right. So... Um, um, and similarly, like, how do I know when I, when I put my hands against a football and press, and I have this simple idea of solidity that I perceive, how do I know that the football will forever pre prevent my hands from touching unless it's moved out of the way? Well, again, the answer is... Um, it's a necessary property of things that have solidity. I can, it's a necessary connection between the property of causing me to perceive that idea and the complicated property of not allowing my hands to go through and touch each other. Um, um, and as I mentioned last time, and you know, I mean, if if this just sounds like gobbledygook to you, you, go ahead and ignore it. But for people who are interested in the relationship between Locke and Kant, you know, this is Locke saying that we do have synthetic a priori judgments, as Kant would, would put it. So that's also why I said he's not like a pure empiricist. He, he doesn't think we have pure a priori concepts, as Kant would put it, right? That it's, he doesn't think we have ideas that we didn't get from experience, but he does think that we have propositions that we didn't learn the truth of from experience. Um, his explanation of how that's possible, however, is one that Kant is going to agree with Hume makes no sense. What do you mean we see a necessary connection? That can't be the explanation. But anyway, that's Locke's explanation. All right, so um, um, are there questions about that? Because otherwise I'm going to go on to abstraction. And yeah, um, believe me, I'm well aware that I have to get to the new material for this week somehow, but I, but I can't skip abstraction. I don't know. Uh, the truth is I actually at some point had the idea of like recording supplementary lectures about things I didn't have time to talk about, but then I look and see how often the recordings of the actual lectures are viewed, and I'm like, no one's going to watch the, second, the supplementary lectures. There's no point. Anyway, um, so I'll just have to do the best I can. So abstraction. Um, uh, 
So abstraction is another operation of the mind besides perception. Um, um, that is, there's another faculty or power in the mind besides the power of sensing and reflecting called the power of abstraction and its operation is the operation of abstraction. Um, and, uh, um, however, Locke says that that operation, unlike the operations of sensation and reflection, is active, not passive. Right? Abstraction is something we do. Um, and, uh, after perception, it's, I guess, the most important other mental operation, according to Locke. And the one he's, he says, distinguishes human beings from other animals. Um, however, I think in order to understand what abstraction is, we have to look back at some of the other mental operations that come between perception and abstraction. Oh, wait, I noticed there's a question in the, in the chat I didn't answer. It. Is Locke saying that these necessary connections can only be understood through the senses or apprehended through the senses? Well, they're not. I mean, part of what's weird about this view is that it's not clear what to say. I mean, in answer to that question, they're not apprehended. So they're not literally visible. They're not colors or light or something. You're, Right, so um, we don't literally perceive them through the sense of vision. Do we have another sense by which we sense them? But that's going to cause all kinds of problems, um, aside from the fact that it doesn't seem true. <laughs> um, so, um, um, so it's a little bit unclear what, say, what faculty of the mind is involved in noting perceiving whatever these connections. Um, I don't know that Locke has a has an answer to that. If he does, I don't know what it is. <laughs> like I said, Hume and Kant are both going to say, basically, uh, well, I mean, so Hume is going to say there could be no such faculty. Kant is going to say there could be such a faculty, but it couldn't be um, um, a kind of perception. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's the best I can do to answer that question. Okay, anyway, so back to the mental operations that go between perception and abstraction. So before even that, I want to talk about the kind of ideas, and there are weird kind of ideas that come along with every other idea. And um, so, uh, I don't know what to call these. I mean, I know I want to call them transcendental ideas, but that would be uh, tendentious. So let me just call them like, Universal ideas. Well, let's see, but that also means something. Hmm. I guess I'll just have to call them ideas that come with every idea. <laughs> and there's two that Locke mentions explicitly, existence and unity. Right, so um, going back to book two, chapter seven. On page 131. Wait, that's not right. Oh. Well, maybe it is. Oh, 
Oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong page. All right. Book 2, Chapter 7, Section 7, on page 131. Existence and unity are two ideas that are suggested to the understanding by every object without and every idea within. Now, I mean, by the way, when, so when you say there is suggested by every object without and every idea within, it, pr it presumably doesn't mean sometimes you perceive the idea and then you get existence and unity suggested with that, and other times you observe the object without and you get existence and unity from that. Because um, perceiving the idea and perceiving the object itself are the same thing. Right? It's just one is the immediate object and the other is the immediate object. So this means somehow that, like, that sameness also applies to these ideas of existence and unity. They apply both to the immediate and to the immediate object in some sense, which is a little hard to understand. But anyway, okay, so the suggested to the understanding by every object without and every idea within. When ideas are in our minds, we consider them as being actually there, as well as we consider things to be actually without us, which is that they exist or have existence. Right? So that's why existence comes with every idea and everything. I guess I should say, well, no, maybe I'll talk about this in a second. But obviously, I mean, in perception, when we have the idea, we also attribute existence to the thing that causes that idea. In memory, for example, we don't. At least we don't attribute present existence, the idea that object that causes the idea. But we still attribute some kind of existence to it. Okay, but anyway, so that's existence. And whatever we can consider as one thing, whether a real being or idea, suggests to the understanding the idea of unity. So again, unity comes with every idea and with every external object or internal object, I guess, right? Like operations of the mind also have existence and unity. Um, now, I mean, there's another one, there's at least one more, but it seems like, although Locke doesn't say this, that we should probably add to this list, which is the idea of power, right? Because remember, the idea of an idea is an idea of the power to cause us to perceive that idea. So, like, if I'm looking at the snowball and it has the quality of whiteness, it's called W, the big W, and it causes me, this is my mind here, it causes me to perceive the idea of whiteness. What is the idea of whiteness the idea of? It's the idea of the power to cause me to perceive the idea of whiteness. Now, if there's another idea, the idea of power, which Locke is going to talk about later, where do we get the idea of power? Um, well, whatever you want to say about that, presumably what you don't want to say is that it's because this has a quality of powerness that causes me to perceive the idea of power. I mean, for one thing, that's like one too many powers, right? I mean, but for another thing, it's this power isn't even helpful. I want to know how I have the idea of this power. So, I mean, that is, that's why I want to say that, you know, every time something causes me to perceive the idea of it as a power, it also causes me to perceive the idea of power. So it's like existence and unity. It comes in with every idea, so to speak. Now, I mean, maybe it's not that important if I'm right about, well, at least not in the present context, if I'm right about that or not. But, um, but let me come back to the other point I was making about memory. Wait. 
transcontinental ideas. Okay. Uh, right. Um, so, um, right, when we say that the idea of a snowball always comes along with the idea of power and existence, we don't mean that you can't think of a snowball, that is, Locke doesn't mean you can't think of a snowball without believing that it exists and is operating on you right now. On the contrary, when I, when I tell you, consider a snowball, if you obey me, you think of a snowball right away, even though you don't believe there's a snowball here. So um, I, that's, not, that's neither perception nor memory, right? That's fancy or imagination, right? But just talk about the simple case, memory. So when I remember a snowball, I attribute existence and power to what I'm remembering, but not present existence and power past existence and power. Now, you might say, well, what about that imagined snowball? When do I attribute existence and power to it? Well, the answer is never to the snowball, but the simple ideas that make up my idea of, that make up my idea of that imaginary snowball all have to have been acquired from experience. Which means that when I get them not via sensation, they always come along with the consciousness that I've had them before. So even an imagined idea is made up of memories, so to speak. Right? It's my memory of, pre of previously seeing whiteness, feeling coldness, whatever, even if I've never actually... Um, encountered a snowball, right? Like I imagined a unicorn, which I've never encountered. Nevertheless, all the ideas that make up the idea of the unicorn are memories of times I've actually perceived those ideas, right? But so coming back to the difference between perception and memory, um, so what this means is that existence in particular whether ideal existence, the existence of the idea, or real existence, the existence of the external thing, um, existence comes, so to speak, modified by a time. Now, I mean, again, I don't know, there's a place, there's no place that Locke officially sits down and discusses this systematically, but he, I think he presupposes it everywhere if you pay careful attention. He's consistent in thinking this way. And so, I mean, of course, it doesn't mean, so in the case of the idea, it comes along with a, this extra consciousness or extra per, added perception, as he calls it, that I've had that idea before. In the case of the object of the idea, it comes along with, you know, the either the added perception that it's here now or the added perception that it's not here now, but it was. Um... And when I say it comes along with this kind of modification by time, of course, I don't mean that every idea and the object of every idea come along with like a time stamp according to some particular clock and calendar, right? That obviously is not plausible. Infants don't know about that. And anyway, it's not plausible for lots of reasons. But what I mean is that they always come with a consciousness of coexistence and succession relations of coexistence and succession right i either this idea is the I, these two ideas are ideas of things at the same time or they're ideas of things at different times and if they're at different times one has to come after the other um and Locke doesn't, he, like I said, in one case he calls it an added perception. He, he doesn't think to, seem to think of these as additional ideas. He doesn't say what they are, but they seem like, that's why I use the term modification. They're like a way the idea of existence or the idea of power and presumably also unity that goes along with them can be like remain the same idea but still be in a certain way different. And Locke recognizes several things like this. 
Um, and I think this is one of them. Right, so with that preface then, you know, so first of all, what he says about memory, this is book two, chapter 10, section two, on page one, bottom of page 147. Uh, right, so he's just been saying before this that ideas are, memory is a kind of storehouse in which our ideas are sitting around until we want them again. But then he takes that back and says, actually, that's not the most precise way of explaining it. He says, but our ideas being nothing but actual perceptions, by which he means, I guess, the immediate objects of actual perceptions. The perceptions are operations, not ideas. But anyway, but um, our ideas being nothing but actual perceptions, in the mind, which cease to be anything when there is no perception of them. This laying up of our ideas in the repository of the memory signifies no more but this, that the mind has a power in many cases to revive perceptions which it has once had with this additional perception annexed to them that, is ha that it has had them before. Right, so what he's saying is, you know, when you first think about memory, you might think of it as, um, you might think of memory as like, you know, first I perceive the idea the first time, and then, you know, this is step one, and then step two is I go on to do other stuff, to carry out other operations. But meanwhile, I put this idea in my storehouse here. And here it is. And then later, when I remember it, I bring it back out of the storehouse. And then I have a new operation. This is sensation, let's say. And then this is memory. Now I have a new operation with the same idea that I brought back out of the storehouse. The idea should be in the mind. But, Abe, Abe, yes. Sorry. Um, I, oh, was I didn't switch to, to the board. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, oh, just sorry. making sure. Thank you. Ooh, there we go. Let me go over this again, right? So you might think of memory this way. First I have the sensation, I perceive this idea, then I have this storehouse, I put the idea in the storehouse and I go on to carry out other operations. And then later when I remember it, I take the idea back out of the storehouse and I make it the object of a new operation, memory. Right? But Locke says, Although Locke first, you know, uses that metaphor, then he says, but this isn't really accurate because actually an idea is nothing when it's not being perceived. So this, this thought that there's an idea sitting in a storehouse doesn't really make sense. An idea is just the immediate object of a mental operation. There's no mental operation that has this as its object, therefore it's not an idea. Now, this doesn't mean that Locke doesn't think something happens, some permanent change happens in my brain or whatever. He just thinks that's not the idea. The idea is only there when it's being perceived. So ideas can't be put in a storehouse and brought back. Rather, what this storehouse thing really comes to is just that if I've had this idea before, when I want to, I can have it again. But not just that I can have it again, because that would mean something like, you know, I've seen a snowball before, so whenever I want to, I can see a snowball again. That's not true, right? <laughs> um, I may have seen a snowball before, but I can't see one now. There aren't any here. But what can, what, what's true is that I can have the idea of a snowball with the consciousness that I've had it before. And I think you would have to, I, I would want to add here, with the consciousness that I've had it before, and that its object existed before, not now. 
Right, so this again involves both uh, like time modification of the ideal existence of the idea, which is the idea is here now, but there's the added perception that I've had it before, and a kind of time modification of the um, uh, existence I attribute to the external object, namely that it doesn't exist now, but it existed then. So that's how memory works. Um, right, so that's one operation. So let's say, you know, we could start with sensation or reflection. And then, um, and then memory. And then um, the next operation after memory is discernment. I'm not going to talk about every single operation Locke talks about, but I talk about most of them. So the next operation that comes after memory is discernment, meaning um, like telling that one idea is not another. But I think the this time modification thing is also necessary to explain how discernment works. Um, So because ideas are always like come with the consciousness that they're um, simultaneous with each other, all the ideas I'm having at the same time kind of go together. And if I don't pay attention to them individually, it's just like kind of one glom of ideas that go together. And moreover, if I remember it later, I don't can't remember them individually either. I just I again mention remember one glom of ideas that goes together. So there really are many distinct ideas here, but I'm not discerning them. Now I've sometimes described this, and I think Locke sometimes describes this as confusion, but it's not really confusion in the sense that I mix them up with each other or see them as somehow the same when they're not. I'm just not paying attention to the fact that whether they're the same or not. The operation of discernment consists in picking one of these simultaneous ideas out and paying attention to the fact that it's not the same as the others. And the operation of discernment is necessary, is a necessary prelude to the other next operation that Locke calls compounding. So compounding, which is the operation by which we form complex ideas, or one of them anyway, consists in taking two different ideas and putting them together to make my own new idea. So Compounding is really different from, to make a complex idea, is really different from this glom together of ideas that just happen to come in together. Right? This, you can call it a kind of unity, I suppose, but it's passive. It doesn't come from me at all. Right? I just waited and all these ideas came in together. Now, once I've discerned a couple different ideas, either present or remembered or both, I can step back and say, I'm going to put them together. Right? So then I take these two ideas and I say, I'm going to supply them with unity myself out of my will. And Locke describes this as voluntary. Right? So this, let me read. 
Book 2, Chapter 12, um, Section 2 on page 160. This thing is. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's right at the top of the page. I, so he's talking about what complex... No, let's see. Um, he's talking about what complex ideas are. They're ideas made up of simple ones yet are when the mind pleases considered each by itself as one entire thing and signified by one name. Right, so a complex idea, like every idea, has the idea of unity that comes along with it, but in the case of a complex idea, this unity is um, supplied when the mind pleases. Like I said, I unify them. Now, I'm not necessarily committed to the idea that these things always happen in exactly this order, but at least um, it's easy to see them as happening in exactly this order. So, this is supposed to be abstraction being the next operation after sensation, memory, discernment, and compounding. So, I said I discerned these ideas from each other, and now I've put them together. But they both still have this kind of time stamp to them. They're like ideas of things that happen together or that happened one after another. They're ideas that I first had at the same time or I first had one and then I had the other and remembered the first one, right? They're, they're both connected to certain circumstances in which they came in. And the and most important one being the, the time circumstance, but Locke seems to think there are others. You might imagine, for example, the direction from which they came in is another circumstance. So these ideas, when I first do this, um, I get a compound, I get a complex idea, but it's a particular complex idea. Right? Like it's the idea of this snowball, right? So suppose out of all the sensations I'm getting right now, I pick out whiteness and coldness and sphericity and so forth and I discern them from the other ideas that are that are coming in and I put those specifically together and I say this is my new complex idea but it's still the complex idea of whiteness and coldness and sphericity now here so it's the idea of this snowball So even though, I mean, in some sense, I've already done something you could call abstraction. In some sense, even as I, as I think I said before, even before my mind has done anything, I've done something you could call abstraction. Just by the fact that my eye was affected in one way by the snowball and my hand in a different way. And that caused me to perceive two different ideas. I've already separated things that in the snowball were mixed together. It was the same snowball that caused both, just like it's the same sun that darkens fair faces and whitens wax. But I, my sense organs actually have taken those things apart for me. Right? They're like a... 
Um, um, actually, some of our sense organs, like, especially our ears, work just this way. They're like a spectrograph, you know? Like a whole bunch of stuff comes in together. But then the spectrograph has a, great, has a prism or, or gratings or something which like separates different aspects of this that come in all together. And then it has like detectors at different places. And so what was inseparably joined in the original light ray is spread out and detected as separate different things. That's actually exactly how your inner ear works. It's not really how your eyes detect color, but it is how your ear detects frequency. Um, so, um, right, so in a sense, our sense organs have already done the abstraction. And in another sense, as soon as I did this discernment, I've done the abstraction, because I now I'm considering this idea apart from all the others. Um, and in the in some sense, even just doing the compounding is what you could say, now I've really done the abstraction. Because now I've taken these ideas that I'm considering all, apart from all the others and put them together for my own purposes. But it's still not full abstraction because it's still, even though a bunch of other ideas that are around at the same time are left out, and these are joined for my purposes, still this like these circumstances of time and place are still attached to them so i can use this idea again in the future but i can only use it in a memory in the future it will always come with the you know with the consciousness that it was the snowball then that this was the idea of Whereas abstraction, so this here's Locke's description of how abstraction works. On it's book two, chapter eleven, section nine, on page one So he's talking about ideas in connection with names here, which is important, but I'm going to not focus on that for now. So he's just he's talking about how the mind forms general ideas, which are abstract ideas rather than particular. And he says the way this works is the mind makes the particular ideas received from particular objects to become general which is done by considering them as they are in the mind such appearances apart from all other circumstances and the circumstances of real existence. Oh, sorry, and the circumstances of real existence as time, place, or any other um, concomitant ideas. So, um, I guess what I'm suggesting is what's essential to that description is the thing about the circumstances of real existence as time, place. Any other concomitant ideas, yes, it's true, I'm ignoring the other ideas that might be around, but that's not really the function of abstraction in itself, that's the function of discernment. Right? What the, the, the really new thing that happens with abstraction is that I consider, and I don't know how to draw this. Maybe I should have drawn them to begin with with little circumstances. I don't know how much I would have. These are the circumstances. Now, I look at them as they are in the mind, such appearances, without those circumstances. So, I mean, oops, and I, you weren't seeing what I was trying there. Uh, I just can't really see it now either, but <laughs> I just threw little circumstances around these. All right. So, um, um, 
the point is that um, this is what the idea always really was from the first time it came in. It was the idea of whiteness. But from the time it came in, it was like modified or stamped by these circumstances of real existence. The time and place at which it came in, and that is at which its object existed as an external thing. Um, so um, it's only now when I get to abstraction that I'm finally seeing the idea for itself. And once I do that, now I can use that, I, I can match that idea against things that happen at different times, right? So now my idea of snowball is not my idea of this snowball at a particular time. It's not an idea of a snowball at any time. It doesn't, those circumstances of time and place are not mixed into it anymore. It's just the idea of something at any time that's white and round and cold and so forth. And so now I can go out you know, in the snow and look around and say, oh, there's a snowball, by which I mean, like, my perception of that particular, you know, if ignoring those circumstances is the same as my universal idea. Right? Which is quite different from saying, oh, I remember that snowball. I've never seen that snowball at all before. I don't remember it. But I know it matches the idea that I got from previous snowballs and that I abstracted from previous snowballs. Um, okay. That is all I'm going to say about abstraction. I'm going to go on finally to the new material um, in the last 20 minutes or whatever. Um, uh, but I will catch up eventually. I don't, so that means just things are going to have to be left out. But are there questions about abstraction before I go on? I mean, you know, it might not be clear as why I'm giving such a complicated account of it. Um, why not just say, I see a snowball, I take the characteristics of the snowball and separate them and I use them to think about other snowballs. But the reason is, you know, on the, that on the one hand, I'm trying to understand... Um, exactly what that involves according to Locke, especially given the fact that he says that the ideas originally came in simple and unmixed. Um, why do I even need to do this then? Right? The infant at first knew that sweet was not bitter before it knew that wormwood was not sugar plums. So doesn't it, have, doesn't it start with abstract ideas? So I'm trying to explain why, you know, having a simple idea is not the same as having an abstract idea that contains only that one simple idea. And that abstraction involves this whole series of other operations that make it possible. Um, also, I'm anticipating Barclay's objections and to some extent at least trying to defend Locke against them or at least to narrow down what Barclay's criticism could really be. Um, okay. So on, on that note, I'm going to go on and talk about the classification of complex ideas and then a little bit, I guess, about simple modes. Um, right, so this... Um, the classification of complex ideas involves something that's inherently a little bit confusing as far as the terminology goes. So, right, so first of all, you know, all ideas are divided, as we know, into simple and complex. 
then complex ideas are divided into modes, relations, and this is the way Locke usually says this, ideas of substances. This already is a little weird, like shouldn't it be ideas of modes, ideas of relations, and ideas of substances, or modes, relations, and substances? Um, I'm not sure how to explain that difference, but I'm going to try to... Um, I don't know, at least keep it clear when I'm talking about uh, a, um, a relation meaning an idea, and when I'm talking about a relation meaning something that's the object of an idea or that holds between the objects of ideas. So um, that is the immediate objects, the external objects. So anyway, so complex ideas are divided into modes, relations, and ideas of substances, and then modes are divided into simple modes and mixed modes. And this is the thing that I was saying is inherently confusing, that simple modes are not simple ideas, right? Simple modes are a type of complex idea. So he's using simple for two different purposes in the, in the same qualification. Now someone said this, are modes the same thing as qualities? Um, um, well, almost, but not for two reasons. One reason is that some qualities are the causes of simple ideas, whereas modes are complex ideas, <laughs> right? That's maybe, uh, kind of a nitpicking objection, but, that, but that's true, right? So, um, so in that sense, modes are not the same as qualities. Modes are like, um, also modes, according to the system, are a type of ideas. So I think you could say something like, modes are ideas of combinations of qualities. Uh, Carissa says, can we say that mode is more abstract than just quality? Yeah, no, see, I don't think the difference is abstraction. Like I said, the difference is that a mode is an idea. A quality is a power in, uh, in, 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 a, in an external thing. So, or an internal thing. But anyway, a mode is a, is a power in the object that's causing me to perceive the idea. Whereas the mode is an idea. But second of all, a quality is um, something that causes me to perceive. And I guess, you know, strictly speaking, one quality is, it, they're always causes of simple ideas, right? A quality is something that causes me to perceive a certain simple idea. Maybe, well, strictly speaking, is that true? I don't know. Anyway, um, but um, whereas a mode is a bunch of simple ideas that I've put together for some purpose. So I think, you know, a, a mode is the idea that I've formed of um, a way that I consider certain qualities as possibly going together. They don't have to have really ever gone together. And Locke says um, that, for example, at, this is one of the places where his um, theoretical and practical philosophy um, touch. Actually, there's a lot of places in discussing modes where they touch, I should say. But like one way where they first touch is he says, you know, for example, before the founding of the first political societies, people must have had certain ideas of modes um, 
that it, they had never actually experienced because they were planning for the first time to do something that had never been done before. And you could say that actually probably about any artificial thing the first time I make it. First, I have an idea of the qualities that are going to go together in this thing, even though I've never experienced them together. And then I do something to make them actually exist in the same substance. So, yeah. So modes are not the same thing as qualities, but they're related in some way to qualities. In particular, one way they're related to qualities, and they're different from ideas of substances, is that they don't include in them the confused, strange idea of subsistence of something that has those qualities. They're just the qualities taken as possibly going together. Um, right? So if I compare, like, um, um, you know, I should probably talk about this more next time, actually, when I talk about ideas of substances. Let me, let me put off talking about that for the when I talk about ideas of mixed modes and of substances, because the only thing I'm going to try to do in the time that's left is talk about simple modes, which all the rest of all the reading for today was about simple modes, basically. So, um, but yeah, so I'll just say that much. Modes are like only ideas of possible qualities knowing to, going together. They don't include the idea of something that has those qualities. Um, Okay, so what's the difference between simple modes and mixed modes? And so let me like forget about all of this and just talk about the difference in simple modes and mixed modes. So the difference is supposed to be they're both types of complex idea, so they both contain more than one simple idea put together on purpose for my purposes, but um, in the case of mixed modes, the different ideas that are put together are, are different. <laughs> that sounded like a tautology. <laughs> um, the ideas that I, I'm putting together, um, different kinds of ideas, right? Like, um, the idea of a snowball is the idea of a substance, I guess. But if I would say, you know, the idea of, um, snowiness or something. There's a reason it's hard to come up with an example like this. Um, um, uh, but anyway, the idea of snowiness as a quality that something might have is like, um, contains the idea of cold and the idea of white, among other. Cold and white are very different ideas, and I've put them together to make a mixed mode. Whereas the simple modes only contain one simple idea, only it's been somehow put together with itself. Now that's a hard thing to understand, but that's, but it's an important thing to understand because that's how Locke thinks he, he can explain his ideas of number, space, and time. So that's, that's pretty important, right? What The things that are simple modes are pretty important. Um, okay, so someone, HT says, would like dogness count, chairness, etc. Would other things also be considered mixed that are not like those examples? Yeah, so I mean, Um, in the case of maybe artificial things are a better example, like sheerness. So in the case of natural things, we usually put our ideas together because we think that the qualities actually go together in something. And so we usually form the idea of a substance rather than a mode. So that's why dogness is kind of a weird idea that we don't usually have a use for because we only think about dogness when we think about dogs, which are substances that have dogness. 
right? Chairness is a little bit better an example because, again, like if no one had ever made a chair, we could still have the idea of chairness and we would use that as a guide to make something into a chair. And maybe even in a sense, we still do that. And even those of us who don't make chairs still think of chairs as things that are made by people. And so maybe chairness is still more of a mode than the idea of a substance. But the types of examples that Locke gives of mixed modes are actually usually moral, legal, ethical examples or examples related to that. So, you know, like courage, um, drunkenness, hypocrisy, um, um, they're ideas that we put together um, not because we think that they are actually together in something, but, but we think that they either should or shouldn't be together in something. Um, that's why we make the idea of a mode. I don't know if any of that was helpful or not. But I mean, so anyway, if we did have an idea of dogness, it would be a mixed mode, right? Because dogs have, I guess, I mean, what ideas go into the idea of dog? They're not all the same color. This is a, this is going to cause all kinds of problems. But, you know, I mean, uh, they basically have certain colors and textures and whatever that they can be. And we put all those together. You know, they're warm. They move around. A lot of very different kinds of ideas. So that's that would be a mixed mode. All right. Whereas a simple mode. So, um, well, um, the first explanation Locke gives, and this is actually before he's discussed this classification, but he's clearly thinking about it already, um, of, actually, may, oh, maybe he does mention simple mode there already. Oh, no, I was reading the same... Okay, yeah, it is before. So in chapter 11, section, book 2, chapter 11, section 6 on page 154, he talks about this um, operation of enlarging. Section, what did I say? Section 6. Yeah, okay. Oh, and I just realized, oh yeah, he does, he does call it compounding, but he also calls it composition. Under this of composition may be reckoned, that is, under this operation of composition or compounding may be reckoned also that of enlarging. So enlarging is like a subtype of compounding or composition, wherein, though the composition does not so much appear as in more complex ones, yet it is nevertheless of putting several ideas together, though of the same kind. Thus, by adding several units together, we make the idea of a dozen, and putting together the repeated ideas of several perches, we frame that of a furlong. I actually did at some point look up how long a perch is and how long a furlong is, but now I forget again. <laughs> but anyway, a perch is like several yards, I think, and there's quite a few perches in a furlong, but I don't remember how many. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, so um, this seems relatively easy to understand. I mean, it includes to begin with already something kind of strange, but like, so how do we form the idea of two? Maybe a couple things that are kind of strange. So first of all, the way we form the idea of more of something is to form more idea. <laughs> that's, that's what calling this enlarging means, right? So if we want to form an idea of two things or the idea of a couple as Locke sometimes calls it, to show that we have one word for it, I guess. If we want to form the idea of two, or of two things, what do we do? We take our idea of unity, or of an unit, which is the idea of one thing, 
Now we stick another copy, so to speak, of the same idea on it. And now we have an idea that's twice as big. So it's an idea of something twice as big. <laughs> There's twice as much of whatever it's an idea of. And that's the way we form the ideas of numbers. So that in itself is a little bit strange. It's even stranger when we think about length, right? Like the reason the idea of a furlong is the idea of a longer length than the idea of a perch is that the idea of a furlong is bigger than the idea of a perch. <laughs> it's longer. That's a little bit strange. It's not certainly not self-evident that uh, that's the right way to think about it, but um, but it, on the other hand, it seems relatively understandable. I mean, there's also some question about this. If these ideas are all identical to each other, they're all the idea of an unit, and they're all simultaneous with each other, why isn't there just one of them? <laughs> right? Like, what does it mean to stick the same idea to itself? Where, in what space are they spread out from each other, so to speak? That's also a kind of weird thing about this theory. Um, but uh, um, aside from that, it's relatively understandable in the case of number, at least. You know, we form the idea of, we have the idea of one that comes in with every idea, the idea of an unit. I think it's clear, it's not so clear here, but it's clear from the beginning of chapter is it 16 that's about number or 17? Maybe 17. Anyway, it's, um, um, it's clear when he talks about unit there that it's the very same idea of unity that comes in with every idea. So, you know, when we have that, once we have the idea of one something, one anything, and then we have two of them, we have the idea of two things, and we have three of them with the idea of three things, etc. Um, now, so I don't obviously have time to say almost anything more about this, but I just, and again, I guess I'm going to have to leave some of it over for the beginning next time, although that's a losing strategy in the long run, but anyway, that's what I need to do. So, um, so I just want to point out that although this kind of makes sense in the case of number, it doesn't obviously make sense in the case of length. Right? I mean, because, like, so you might think of the analogy something like this. Take the smallest possible length. That would be analogous to a unit in the case of number. And then, if I want a bigger length, add the smallest possible length to itself over and over until I get a big enough length. That is, these are ideas, right? Add the idea of the smallest possible length to itself over and over until I get an idea of the length that I want. Now, I mean, Barclay and Hume are both going to say, actually, that our ideas of length are like that. In somewhat different ways, but they're both, they're both going to agree that our ideas of length are like that. But uh, Locke can't agree with that because Locke says there's no such thing as the idea of the smallest possible length. Um, all right, so Krista asks, putting together ideas in similar units that are measurable to enlarge. I'm not sure exactly at which point. Oh, I think that came after I was already talking about length. So, yeah, so instead what you have to say is like what he said in the case in the furlong and perch case. We start with a perch, which is not the smallest possible length. It's kind of long. And we add perches together to get a foot furlong. So once we have a unit of length, we understand how we can form the ideas of larger lengths by this operation of enlarging. But um, that's got to bottom out somewhere. How did we get the original unit of length? Right? I mean, you might say, Oh, well, I got the idea of a perch because it's so many yards, so I added together the idea of yard over and over again. You know, but again, like, it can't go on forever. I want to see Carissa has her hand up, but... Uh, hey, 
Um, yeah. So, yeah, I have a question. Can we can we say the difference between simple modes and mixed modes to be like simple modes describe well uh, describe it's more about qual qu quantitative and mixed modes is more about like qualitative like. Uh, different simple ideas put together that's like different oh i don't want to use quality but in some way it is it kind well, of just describe that that I mean, specific mode such I, as yeah. murder or beauty or something like that I, I think that's i think that's largely true although he does discuss some other examples of simple modes that don't sound so quantitative but i think to the extent that it's true it's true because like what is quantity <laughs> Ray, I mean, what is you know what do you what does it mean to call something quantitative? It means it could be measured by a unit or something like that, right? So so that's why the I at least the ideas of quantities are going to be simple modes, if not it's always like, the other way it, around. Yeah, it's kind of like let's say infinity, right? Even though we cannot really count it, but we have an idea of it because we keep repeating. And we can yeah, use that yeah, okay. I mean, sort I of don't, unit to describe anything. Yeah. There's a whole chapter about infinity, which I'm not going to, I'm already over time, so I'm not going to be able to talk about that. I just, you know, I just, I want to say that I think that um, if you read carefully, Locke thinks that there's um, um, more than one way of getting a simple mode out of a simple idea. And enlarging is only one of them. But in the case of length, the simple idea is not the idea of a very short length. The simple idea, Locke says that um, the idea of space is a simple idea. Right? So every one of these modes of space is a modification of that simple idea of space. So if it's not the idea of a tiny piece of space, it's like the idea of spaciness in general, so to speak. And the um, simple modes are made by limiting it, not by enlarging it. But like I said, I'll have to talk more about that next time. So I will see you then. Okay. Bye.